and welcome to the backstory. As a volunteer for Longmont Public Media, I'm Tim Waters and, and the host of the backstory. And we're coming to you tonight live from the Longmont Public Media studio at 3rd and Kimbart. So if you're not in our studio audience and you'd like to be, remember this a month from now, we're going to do the September uh, uh, episode of the backstory on, on Tinker Mill. So we have with us tonight the studio audience and they're going to be invited to participate in tonight's program. The topic is housing. I think we're going to cover like every conceivable question on housing from A to Z. And we're going to do that with a distinguished panel. Uh, tonight, I am joined by folks who are both experts and advocates when it comes to housing in, in, the, in Boulder County and in Longmont specifically. Joining me tonight is Harold Dominguez. See, Longmont, he's, he's known well, he doesn't need an introduction as Longmont <laughs> City Manager, but tonight he's here with his uh, hat on as the interim director of the Longmont Housing Authority, because in that role, he's both a developer and a manager of affordable housing. Correct. Edwina Salazar, who everybody in Longmont knows as the former director of the Hour Center, but she's here tonight as a member of Prosper Longmont, and we're going to have a chance to learn more about what Prosper Longmont is, who it is, kind of what what they're bringing to this conversation. Anne Marie Jensen uh, has been a longtime activist in policy and politics. I know has a whole career as a lobbyist and has really focused more recently as the founder of ECHO, East, House, uh, East County Housing Coalition, uh, Opportunities Coalition, ECHO. And we're going to come, we'll talk more about ECHO before we're finished tonight in, in an event that ECHO has coming up. And Eric Wallace, known to most Longmonters or long monsters, as Eric would say, as the founder and CEO of uh, Left Hand Brewing. But he is also here tonight with his Prosper Longmont hat on. So I I'm going to give each of you a chance to, to talk about your interests and in, in why you're around this table. But I, but I want to start, Eric, with you. Um, you're spending a fair amount of time, in addition to what you do <laughs> with your business, on this topic of housing. So. What brings you, what, what, what piques your interest in, in frame a Prosper Longmont for it? So we, we know who it is and what you're up to. Well, I would say that it's driven by really two, two things. Number one, my own kids can't afford to buy a house in Longmont right now. I have three children. Um, two live in Firestone, and one lives in our rental house that we have here in Longmont. So my own children being unable to afford housing was, was the first driver. Number two over half of my crew at the brewery can't afford to live in Longmont. They live out of county. Um, so Boulder County is extremely expensive. Longmont has become quite expensive. And it became a problem for me, and not only for me, but for many other business people with whom I speak. I serve on the Longmont Economic Development Partnership Board. And in meetings and conversations, it became apparent that it is the number one problem for businesses is, is housing our people that work for us and the affordability of that. And as they drive farther and farther away, their tenure tends to go down. They're spewing more pollutants into the atmosphere. Their quality of life is going down. Our tax base, they're spending money in other communities. So all of these byproducts of, of sprawl and lack of affordability in Longmont caused me to, to want to really lean in here and see if we can fix it. So what captures <clears throat> from a prosper Longmont perspective is the effects of the a housing shortage or the cost of housing the effect on a workforce? Yeah, it's a its stability huge. and in 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 its yeah. uh, uh, productivity when they show up. We'll get to the question, but yeah, it's a yeah. supply and demand imbalance, and it's not just here; it's everywhere. But Ken Marie, what you really you've been you've focused on a variety of policy issues over time, but you're really zeroed in now on housing. Talk about why. What brought you to this? Well, I was a lobbyist for almost forty years at the state level. And one of the things I worked on as a lobbyist was affordable housing. And I also worked as a volunteer in Boulder County. Um, we have had two elections since I've lived here to try to get more funding for affordable housing. One was in the city of Boulder and one was in the county, both of which failed. And I've also been involved in trying to get housing cited, affordable housing, and seen the strong opposition to it. And so when I retired from being a lobbyist, I spent some time thinking about what I would do next. And it seemed there was a real need for an education and advocacy organization to try to support efforts to create more housing for people who couldn't afford it here. And so that includes both affordable 
and attainable. And, and those are not exactly the same thing. Um, and uh, we can talk later about yeah. what those are, but um, we support both kinds of housing. And um, we work in five communities, um, Longmont, Erie, Lafayette, Superior, and Louisville. So basically all the communities east of Boulder um, in this direction, we are doing some kind of work trying to support housing in those communities. That's the East County Housing Opportunities Coalition. Yes. Edwina, uh, you spent, for as long as I've been in Longmont, uh, you've been connected with the Hour Center until you turned that page fairly recently. But, but you're now really focused on housing along with, with others. What brings you to the housing uh, concern? Well, I've worked my entire life with people who are under-resourced, who have trouble having the, all the resources necessary to advance, to get an education, to get good jobs. Um, and Prosper Longmont was very interesting to me because I, when I talked to Eric, I heard in what they're looking at is the interrelationship of all aspects of the community with housing. And I was very interested in being um, an advocate for people who are under-resourced, for people who work in the service economy and who need assistance with getting an education, uh, getting, maintaining their housing. Um, but it's all related to every other aspect of the community. So that was really attractive about Prosper. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> how, many, how many leaders in our community are part of Prosper? Just roughly. Is it a handful? Is it a uh, dozen? It's, is a, it's it... a couple dozen um, that are fairly closely related and a few dozen more, more loosely related, but uh, you know, absolutely aware of, of what we've got going on. And, and uh, for those of you, I, I, I'm going to do this because I've heard I've heard others characterize Prosper Longmont in various ways, and I think I'd like for people to hear from you what your frame or your understanding of Prosper Longmont is. How many developers are, are part of, how many people who will profit from more residential development are members of Prosper Longmont? We don't really have developers as part of, of Prosper. It's a, it's a cross-section of the community, people with a wide variety of experiences. Um, so, and we've tried to basically, I mean, we're working closely with, with Anne Marie. We're working with Habitat. We're, we've got a lot of resources across the spectrum, people that are really expert in lending, um, local banks, um, local, local mortgage lenders. How do we open it up more and, and trying to understand where are the friction points and why, why are we unable to house our people? Well, that's why, why can't we do it? So it's <laughs> it's basically been a learning process yeah. and, and poking at a lot of things, trying to understand it. That's going to be a segue to the next question, but I'm going to give Carol a chance to weigh in here. But just just to be clear, uh, how much how will you two profit as a result of long, Prosper Longmont's success? Uh, <laughs> less <laughs> traffic. <laughs> if, if we can house more people here, less people be driving under, under you know, on 119 under I-25, less... I think of that elusive quality of life yeah. issue. Yeah. And I enjoy personally living in a, country, of a, in a place that's diverse. Um, I want to live in a place that's diverse. Uh, I, I want to be able to walk down the street and see any number of people of all walks yeah. of life. And um, that's what I believe is a healthy community. So, so the answer to, to my question is neither of you will, will benefit other than for the values that you've just articulated in, in what we first It's My kids and my people, yeah. they, they need quality of life too. I just think that's an important part of this conversation that there are, everybody brings their values, right, to this conversation about housing and they, they get reflected in our rhetoric and then ultimately in initiatives and advocacy and policy. Um, but but values like diversity and stability of a workforce and, and family uh, do, do show up in these conversations, just not all about bottom line dollars and cents or just the numbers of homes, right? You, obviously, we're going to talk more about building more homes and how we got here. Harold, you're not off the hook in this. Uh, come at this with your, how, how did you end up being a, a developer, right? Right. <laughs> and what are your interests in, in, in this issue 
not from a city management perspective, but from a housing authority perspective? Well, so I'll start with the housing authority, but I think it's important to talk from a city management perspective as well. So uh, many people may know that um, the city took over the operations of the housing authority. And, and so by default, I became the interim executive director of the housing authority. And one of the things that we, that we know is um, housing authority budgets are really built on the operating revenues that they have coming in and also the development revenues that you have for building properties. And, and so when we began looking at the, you know, just the financial condition of the housing authority, we knew we needed to build units fast. We also knew the need of the affordable housing component within our community. And so when I talk about affordable housing, that's really related to the housing authority and the rental piece. Um, and, and when we talk about that, it's really important. We're really talking about 60% AMI and below. Subsidized. Subsidized housing. Um, and when we started looking at our housing authority portfolio, most of the units that we had were actually age restricted units for older adults. We only had really one unit that was uh, uh, for families. And so as we started looking about just the need for affordable housing, we really started um, going through the development process. And so it's a unique opportunity for me because, you know, I sit on one side of the house in terms of the regulatory uh, component on this, but being on the development side has been a, a great learning experience for me in terms of the, the challenges that you face. And and so we had to very quickly do a rehab on Aspen Meadow, which was an age-restricted unit. We had to finance um, a non-age-restricted unit in the development of Chrisman II, which is under construction. We actually um, had tax credits associated with that, had to build the uh, you know, the, the we had to build the equity stack and understand how that relates to expenses and just really looking at the, the amount of pressure that comes into play on the financial portfolio. And, and when you're trying to close a deal and you have a hundred thousand dollar hit that may kill the deal if you can't manage it. And so that was a great learning experience. Um, and so we have about a few more projects moving forward that we're looking at from the housing authority perspective. But, you know, what I learned in that biggest variable that's playing in this is land cost. Um, that in its own right is a significant issue for us to overcome in the development of affordable housing. And when we talk about that, we're saying uh, fully supportive housing, which is 30% AMI below to 60% AMI would be average median income to 60% in terms, and that's really that transition you start making into um, market rate housing on the rental side. Just so so that because people hear these terms right. AMI and or area median income and percentages, that 30% is 30% of what that income level is. Correct. And then what percentage of someone's income they're going to have to spend on housing. Correct. Which becomes kind of the formula or the algorithm for what qualifies, right? Correct. And, and so when we talk about 30% AMI below, that's fully supportive housing. And we're talking about mental health services, financial services, um, working on health side, because th that is... Um, a demographic that really has a lot of those issues. So that's the gamut of affordable housing. Short of assisted living, but supportive housing. Correct. And, right. and that's something we're working on too, is um, and working through the issues with the council and, and the housing authority board as part of the ARPA funds. We did set aside one and a half million for affordable assisted living because being on the housing authority side and seeing the number of people that live in um, affordable housing um, that is independent living and really seeing how many people need to be in assisted living and the fact that there's no options really available for yeah. affordable assisted living. That's another piece. If I can go on real quick, you know, I have the same issue as an employer as a city manager. And so when we look at the staff of our organization, um, today I think we're roughly at 42% of our staff that um, work for the city actually live in the city. Um, and as we move through a transition period, you know, when we have someone retired that lives in the city, more times than not, the people that fill those positions actually don't live in Longmont. And that's really the nature of the attainable housing cost that we have. And these are people that do really well. Same employees that Eric's talking about. Um, that just can't find the housing units. And, and so as an employer, that's an issue because um, we are seeing instances where we have folks that move to other communities and rightfully so, a job opens up in those communities yep. and they take that job because you know what, that improves their quality of life 
their commute. So as an employer, it's an issue for us too. And we really want people who work for the city to live in the city. And so we're, we're incredibly mindful of that as an employer. And then on the city side, obviously the city's engaged in the affordable housing piece. We put a million dollars a year annually on the general fund dollars into affordable housing, but also looking at the attainable housing piece of which we're engaged in a few conversations. So you really see every bit of my life is, is really touching <laughs> some form of housing. And you're a father of two college-age kids who will be looking for a home. A absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> or who will be back, moving back in with you in three or four You years. know, that's a real-world conversation <laughs> when we see housing prices. You know, and not tonight, but in a, maybe another backstory, we'll follow up on, on what we should be anticipating as a city as we have an aging population without the means to be in assisted living what that's gonna mean, because it's a tsunami right. that's coming. Mm -hmm. So we're in this conversation, it's a daunting issue in Longmont in every Boulder County municipality, in every municipality across the country. How did we get here and where are we? Where are the numbers? I know there's some studies that have come out, you guys have your heads deeply into these. Just characterize where are we, where are we in terms of supply versus demand and how did we get here? Who wants um, to start with? I'll that? start. Because I've been spouting out yeah. those numbers quite a bit. Um, there's about a 10 million unit shortage nationwide. And if you start interpolating that number and a couple of numbers that have come out last year and this year again out of the state in a, a recent state land use report um, and another housing task force report, you can see that, that they all point to in Longmont, we are between 6,500 and 8,000 units short. Um, or here in the, in, the, in the near term in the next couple of years. We already have a huge deficit. So it's, it is a supply and demand issue and it's not just Longmont. And we can't solve Longmont's issue just in Longmont, which is why people like Anne Marie are here, why we're talking with people down in Boulder and in other areas as well, because whatever we're able to learn and, and figure out and fix has to be exported to other communities. The land use, um, the land use thing that we were talking about earlier, this, this land use report um, points out a lot of, of what's going on and how that's going to have to change, not just in Longmont, but statewide. Um, and I don't want to get into to, to more of the wonky stuff about home rule and land use yeah. and how it's determined locally. But all of those things all feed into the fact that the simple answer, we haven't been building enough housing and, and we don't have a variety of housing. And I just want to jump back in and change the subject slightly. Prosper Longmont is focused on non, non-subsidized housing. Unsubsidized. The market rate. And, and basically, we want to butt up against where capital A affordable housing start, stops, which comes up to 80% really of AMI. And we're focused on 80 to 120% AMI. So we want to make, that's the bulk of our workforce. That's, that's what, and we want for purchase homes because what we see right now is a lot of people renting that would like to own. We see a lot of young families unable to sink their roots in yeah. to the community and start building equity. And this inability to build equity over time ties into a lot of other societal disconnects and, and inequalities that we've got. But I have a big fear for my kids' generation and beyond. If we can't get people owning and living and having an equity stake within Longmont, it's going to change the entire nature nature of our of our city. I think. Yeah. Oh, sorry. yeah no, go, go ahead. ahead. Pick it up. I, I'd like to piggyback that a little. I think Eric touched on it's it's not just that we haven't built housing, but it's also the kind of housing we've built. We really focused on single family residential, mm -hmm. which a lot of people would call the American dream. Well, that has excluded other things. Uh, we are trying to change that now. You see more townhomes, paired homes, things like that. But when land is the big cost, as Harold mentioned, if you don't go up or if you don't take advantage of efficiencies and how you use land, you make housing more expensive. But we are also a very desirable community. And part of the reason we're desirable is our parks, our open space, uh, our lands, our hiking trails, uh, you know, we have a lot of beautiful amenities here, which creates more demand here than maybe someplace that isn't as attractive. So, and wages <laughs> have not gone up proportionately to the way that land costs have gone up. So 
And we are also becoming more and more of a service economy with people in the lower end of that, a lot of restaurants, retail, you know, coffee shops, bookstores, and those people have historically not made a living wage. And that has been exacerbated by this high cost of land in comparison to the wage. But I, I, I think, and Edwina started on this, we have intentionally are a segregated community, all of the communities in Boulder County. We had things in our laws and policies says people of different colors shouldn't live together. That is the history of the United States. We had mortgage policies that enforce that. We had other kind of real estate policies that enforce that. So those of us who are white folk have had privilege and advantage when it comes to housing. But the GI Bill is another example. You know, when soldiers came back from World War II who were people of color, they think they officially had the same benefits but they had trouble accessing them and they didn't get to use them in the same way. So we have a history of racism in the housing. And if we want to change that, we have to be intentional about it. If we want to create the diversity that makes for a vibrant, thriving community, we gotta get, we gotta get into it more. And some people are afraid of that. Uh, and so we can talk later about, you know, how do we, how do we change those fears? I have a question that we're going to come right back to you on that. Okay. <laughs> so, well, I it, think it's even greater than uh, color diversity or, you know, there are places in our country where families with children can't live. And uh, I think that's one question we need to ask ourselves. Do we want a community where families can thrive and children can live in safe housing um, and you know we could become San Francisco where there are a limited number of children because families can't afford to, to live there. So we've had zoning issues we've heard we've learned a lot about redlining and, and, and mortgage qualification and who does and who doesn't I mean all those roll up if you add to that what happened during the Great Recession right when, if you just looked at the data in Longmont, the number of housing permits that declined year over year over year for a decade until there were almost none. We're still trying to catch up from that in Longmont. Carol, do you want to weigh in on this one? Or? Uh, yeah, it's kind of hard. I think when you look at it, um, I, I think there's some great points that have been made. So um, I think density is incredibly important to keep in mind in this conversation because when, when you look generally at the housing stock in, in Longmont, it is you know, the traditional single family lots. Um, you know, and granted over time, the yards have gotten smaller, but you still have yards. And, and so what happens is, is when you look um, at an acre of land and, and maybe you put three, maybe you put four units, but when you look at where a lot of communities are moving nationally, you know, they're looking at higher densities, really approaching it from the brownstone town, brownstone concept, town home, um, narrow sit back homes um, and that's different than anything we have in this community but the reason you have to do that is because when you look at high land cost you have to maximize your density to reduce what the cost is to each home and then in today's market you know you, you layer the different cost components onto it so you have land costs coming in then you have the vertical construction costs then you have the horizontal construction cost you have the soft costs that are associated with the financing in, uh, architecture, engineering, and those components, and then you have permits and fees that the city comes in. And so you have all of these costs layering on to a project, and so you really need that density to, to help minimize what the impact is to each individual unit. And there's some projects we're working on where we're neck deep in this right now, um, and when you look at what's the solution, it, it, it is a housing type that is not consistent with what we've seen, but it is a housing type that looks at density um, in some cases, you're going to need height in order to get those units um, where people have the ability of home ownership. And, and I, you know, I think that's where we're, we're really working as a housing authority, as a city staff, and other aspects is really dissecting the pro formas and understanding what are the variables. Because at the end of the day, it, it goes back to the old adage, you know, death by a thousand cuts. In order to tackle this problem, you're going to have to look at everything because there's not one single solution to this to the challenge we're facing. So there are some in in Longmont, maybe in Lafayette and around the country who would say 
solve your housing problem by stop building. Just don't build any more homes and you won't have people looking for housing in Longmont. Is that a solution? And if not, why not? What are the consequences if we just say, we're gonna do a moratorium, no more housing permits in Longmont, that solves our housing problem. Well, it's, you know, what I would say is what we've seen in the market growth. I mean, and this is as we're digging into the development side of this and what it takes is we're in a very desirable location in the country. I mean, so you gotta put that up on the board. Um, and, and so if you, if you don't increase your supply, I mean, this is basic economic theory. Um, if you don't increase your supply and you're in an area that's really desirable and people are competing on paying for homes to live in your, in your community, those numbers start moving very fast. I'll give you a personal example. Um, six years ago, um, I purchased my house um, thinking my mom was going to move in with me, so I needed a first floor bedroom and some other things. At that time, I paid $430,000 for a, a large house. Um, based on what we've just seen, that's doubled in six years. And I think that really is a personal example to say that's the issue that we're dealing with and back to in the employer had. That's why many of the people that work for the city can't buy homes here is just because of the growth and the pricing of those homes. So I think the answer is you really need to figure out a way to deal with creating additional supply so that you can manage that. And the supply has to be attainable and affordable. And we also have to figure out how do we maintain those units in the attainable and affordable category in, in a longer period of time because it does no good if we build an attainable house and then the next time they sell it, it becomes a market right now. So there's a lot more variables in this. So the effects of just capping it, saying we're not going to build that, will take the edge off the demand? That's how we got here, Tim. <laughs> That's what Boulder has been doing that for decades. Right. And we used to be the, the relief valve for Boulder. But now the pressure is built so high that, the, that everyone understands it, all you're doing is pushing the problem somewhere else, and now it's flooded the entire county. We are still the least expensive yeah. town in the county, if you can believe that, because it's not affordable or it's not attainable. And environmentally, it's really dumb. Um, it forces people who work in Longmont to drive from long distances. So the greenhouse gases, the emissions, the ozone problem, the traffic are all higher because people can't be here. So if you care about the environment, that kind of a cap just pushes the problem out and drives it back in. And it, it is not the, the green way to go. So we do hear, I'm sorry, go yeah. ahead. I, I was gonna say that's an example where we do need to change how we message the need for housing is that it's not this narrow dilemma it's very broad because it will affect transportation. It will affect the environment. And uh, the folks that are saying cap the growth are not necessarily looking at the big picture of how it's going to affect transport, how it's going to affect the environment, how it eventually could affect their own lives if their children can't afford to go to college and move back to Longmont. We hear only two. Take it down to a more basic level. Um, we had certain distances where our water staff and our electric staff, in terms of how far they could city live, employees. city employees to respond to uh, emergency issues, outages, water breaks, things like that. We've had to extend that based on it. And so if you really go kind of what are some practical implications, you know, we've talked about this internally, is how do we deal with a situation if we have an outage or a water leak or, you know, another where we're having to bring people in and how far away are they? Because what that does is it just reduces the time that, that people are going to go through, the, or it increases the time because we'll, they're coming in from further distances. And, and the, the real world challenge is, is if you say, well, you have to be in here within this limit, they go other places to find employment because housing is so important to them. So there is a practical day-to-day -day issue with folks having to move further out. So when it's your electricity that's out, or the water main in your neighborhood that's broken, and the city calls for someone to come and fix it, 
and they can't get here because there's a blizzard or whatever, that's when it becomes real relevant. Uh, yeah, how, how the distance is someone has to go. Example, in the last snowstorm, we bought hotel rooms. Yeah. Uh, we're going to come back. We're going to come I back. I just to want to say one other thing, and that is in, in places that are really high cost, schools have had to close down because young families with children yeah. can't afford to live there. We have two communities in Colorado who declared themselves a housing disaster area because they couldn't get any employees and all the businesses were closing. I heard of a restaurant that took out its refrigerator and put like dorms, you know, in, in there because they needed a place for their employees. So the consequences of that kind of thing, that cap that you just described are, could be really dire. Um, let's, and, let's stay, go ahead. And personal, <laughs> I think you have to bring it down to domino effect yeah. how is that going to be a personal issue down the road what well, you both have mentioned um congestion traffic so there's a there's we hear from time to time stop building and that'll solve your problem and we're saying you're saying no no that just yeah. creates a new problem we also hear and read a lot about traffic congestion you know we have we have too many people where if we continue to grow we're going to have two we're going to have just more intractable traffic congestion are you saying that's not true? Uh, go ahead. I want to well, I'm, wor I'm working on an affordable housing project in Lafayette that's a 400 unit project. And the original opposition to the project was traffic related. People were very worried about the traffic. Well, it turned out the number of units, which was pretty large for an affordable housing project, enabled better bus service. It enabled enough traffic to create some right turn lanes in a place where they were really needed, some traffic circles, and the traffic on measured traffic in that area went from an F to a B with adding 400 units because they qualified for certain things that weren't. So it could be that it could create more traffic, but some of it is how do we grow and are we smart about how we grow? And you could you could put 20 units in somewhere and do it badly and create bad traffic. So th there are smart ways to do that kind of thing so it doesn't create traffic. And just so listeners will understand, F to B, the Department of Transportation, has established very specific criteria for intersections, and they rate them A through F, based on numbers and numbers of, uh, of lights people have to wait to turn left and those kinds of things, and numbers of cars in the intersection. So that's the that's the scale you were talking yes, about. Yes, yeah. thanks. I also want to talk about, and Harold and I have had these conversations as well, how a community is built and designed and developed impacts how far things you need are from where you live. And we've, we have a single family detached kind of community right now, and that's, no, that's not sustainable. The farther you build out, the less, the less fi financially maintainable are your, is your infrastructure. But I don't want to go in that direction. I want to say, if, if you're complaining about traffic, you're probably driving to the store in your car. Well, if you had a store nearby that you could walk or bike to, traffic would be less. And as we, as we grow, because you can't stop growth, we have to grow in a different way where cycle, you know, bicycling and walking are definitely more, more doable. Try walking down South Main Street anytime right now. It is not a walkable corridor. I've done it. But you need to create that kind of mixed use. And that's why you hear mixed use being talked about all the time. Hey, the daycare is right over here. The flower shop's right over here. There's a small grocery store here. I can get a lot of the things I need. My coffee shop's over there. It's all right here in my neighborhood and I'm going to walk there. But I spent a long time living overseas in, in denser, you know, denser countries like Italy and Germany. I've lived in Japan. So I've, I've this seen- is a, This is an Air Force, Air, Air Force vet. Yeah, so I've seen, I've seen a lot the way other places do it. And there's a lot less driving and a lot more walking, and the people aren't as big either. There's health benefits to that. <laughs> well, I think as, as they talk about it, I think when you look at, and I'll just use the word mass transit, but, you know, a bus system, and when, when we talk about, you know, the, the parameters for transit funding is really built on ridership. I mean, and so it's, it is what it is. Everyone complains about you know, they say, well, you don't have enough ridership, so you can't get additional routes and you can't do this. And so it's sort of backwards 
but what we know in that conversation is the more density you have, the more ridership you're going to get, which actually will allow you to make a stronger argument for more transit in your community because you have that density. Um, it is rare to find transit systems that run routes in a bunch of single family neighborhoods. But when you get the density and you start locating it in areas with employment opportunities, that actually can help you get the transit system you need to to make some of these other improvements from an environmental standpoint, reducing traffic. And so density is a piece of that question. It also helps low income people not to have to buy a car and take that out of their budget so they can maybe save to buy a home at some point. So um, capping growth doesn't solve our housing problem. Capping growth doesn't solve our transportation or our congestion problem. It exacerbates it. It makes them both worse. So that's kind of counterintuitive for some mm -hmm. folks, or we wouldn't keep reading about it in, in our the, local newsletters. I think the key is everybody said it's smart growth because you don't want to sprawl either mm -hmm. because that doesn't make sense financially for communities is to just have this sprawl where which you're is just a, Which would out. be a consequence of capping growth within our city limits. It's not going to, you're not going to stop building it. They would just, we would just build outside the city limits. Right. Well, right. In some cities that have been around, um, they just keep doing this. Yeah, yeah. And that gets really expensive. And so it's really a smart growth approach that you have to take. So um, I'm going to come back. First of all, I want to say we have our studio audience that's here. Uh, if, if anybody in the audience has questions and you want to ask one, you queue up over here. I'm going to ask another question and I'll call on our audience members to participate with their questions. Mm -hmm. But I want to come back to the, as they're queuing up, if anybody does, I want to come back to the diversity, equity, and inclusion topic. Um, how should the values, right? We talk a lot about valuing diversity, equity, inclusion as a community. How should those values show up in, in housing policy and on our housing initiatives? Well, I think um, it, it does with the city of Longwell. So programs like the down payment assistance, where people can augment their own resources and scale up. I think that's an excellent example of how you can uh, really increase diversity. Um, the other thing is, uh, I think people can scale up by utilizing uh, education opportunities, which does depend on transportation, uh, programs that are able to stay in a community because they're are people that are utilizing those programs. Um, also, uh, our school district benefits from the diversity and being able to house our teachers who then in turn are educating our youth. And, you know, congratulations to the St. Grand District because over the years they have been working on increasing the graduation mm -hmm. rate. Well, you want those kids to graduate, go to college, the, college rate has radically increased among diverse populations. You want those kids who we've invested in over the years with our city programs or our school programs, we want them back because we put a major investment in them. Yeah, that's our, our, our biggest return on investment in terms yeah. of economic development are our kids. But if they can't afford to come back. Yeah and raise their children here. So what, given the values of diversity, how we value diversity, equity, inclusion, and all the things you just described, why is it so difficult for us uh, to get communities to embrace affordable housing development and opportunities? Anne-Marie, you're right in the middle of this. I am, um, and it's challenging. It really is challenging. Um, I think people are afraid of change. So some of it may not be that they're afraid of affordable or attainable housing. They just don't want their neighborhood to look different than what it looked like when they moved in. They moved there because there was a certain feel and they, I, I, I'm working on an issue uh, where it's a piece of property that's zoned commercial and they, uh, they want to build housing. But the people opposing it are saying, well, what about the owls and the foxes and all the other things that are on that property? And the, the thing is, it's going to be developed. It's either going to be commercial or residential, and the owls and the foxes are not going to be there. You know, they'll be moved into some other area as it gets developed. But I think that's the that sentiment about we live in this place with wildlife. You know, we want to keep our wildlife. And what people need to understand is, if we want to keep our wildlife in our parks and in our open areas, 
our building needs to be in the city limits where we already are urbanized, where we already have sidewalks and we already have sewers and things like that. And that protects our open space from encroachment and sprawl by keeping our building in that area. But I, I believe, number one, people don't know that affordable housing in Boulder County is attractive. And throughout Colorado, some of the best affordable housing developments have actually increased property values and created whole new redevelopment of neighborhoods because it's so attractive that it's brought in businesses, it's brought in other kinds of housing because we've done such a good job. And, and you know, there are lots of examples. Um, the Spokane Kaufman is one. Um, Aspen, uh, Josephine Commons um, in Lafayette, the uh, Pearl Street, I think it's called the Pearl in Boulder, are really good examples of very attractive affordable housing. So I think that's one of the concerns. And I think people are afraid of density. They're afraid they're going to be crowded. They're afraid that there's going to be traffic. And so we have to show them that we can actually do things in a way that doesn't increase traffic. And that requires people to pay attention to this. So appreciating that you're giving us a forum to talk and to be able to say it doesn't have to be that way. And so that's part of what ECHO is trying to do is we are trying to educate people about what is affordable housing. How can it look? How, uh, Josephine Commons in Lafayette has this beautiful community center that during the pandemic became a place where seniors were getting vaccinations, where they were getting meals uh, brought to them because they didn't want to go out, you know, um, groceries brought to them. There are a lot of community amenities, uh, community gardens that can be part of affordable housing. And But people have to not just be knee jerk and not say, oh, I heard about that, the projects in New York, that's what they think about. And that is not what we're talking about. We've done a very good job of building beautiful environments for people to live in in this county and we have to be open to it but but i think some of it's just change you know people are afraid of change i have uh, pages of questions <clears throat> but we do have a member of the audience queued up over here and part of part of this whole storyline is to make certain the public has a chance to have their voice in this as well so this is an opportunity thank you my name is greg i want i retired from urban planning and a few other economic related industries. And I would preface what I'm going to ask you with the observation that density actually predated Henry Ford and what he did, and also predated zoning, because the principal and seminal case in zoning was at Euclid the Amber, which is 1921. So if you look at density as a development strategy, it came about really because of workforce and transportation needs. Well, duh. So I'm curious whether you know of any jurisdictions in Colorado that have studied, implemented, or considered what's really economic zoning. Perfect example of that would be maximum lot sizes. And again, this is all in the residential arena. And uh, how about Longhorn? Uh, I'm gonna, Greg. Thanks for the question. I'm gonna re, I'm gonna try to recapture that just in case the sound system didn't pick it up since we didn't have a mic set aside for our guests. Um, the question really is about economic zoning, not just uh, the kinds of traditional criteria zoning that, we, that we've done from a commercial, multi-use, et cetera, um, and whether or not anybody's familiar with areas that have used economics or economic zoning as the basis for land use. Is that fair? Right. Yeah. I think, you know, what I would say from the, that's what we're digging into right now. I don't think we're calling it economic zoning. But I think what we're looking at is when you're looking Thank at you. when you're looking at workforce housing and, and, and density. Uh, the question, the person who asked the question was correct. It's interesting when you look at communities now. A lot of the housing that you're seeing being developed for home ownership actually looks like housing that was built um, in the early 1900s. We call it shot. You know, people call them shotgun houses. You could shoot. That's what you're seeing people develop. There's some, you know, great example here is in the Stapleton area where they, they did some work there to really maximize density. Um, Austin, Texas has done a great job in the, the Mueller, the re redevelopment of the airport area. So from a city standpoint, that's what we're looking at. And it really, it, 
we're not calling it this, but it really is. How do you bring the things together that you need to to ensure that you have housing available for your workforce? Um, and um, yeah. So I've heard I have heard you in other venues talk about rethinking Longmont's approach to land code, land use, and the land code that goes along with that. Uh, with to, to put an urban frame around that as opposed to an outlying city frame. Correct. What would be the implications of, of an urban uh, approach or the, uh, I guess, I'm not, I'm not certain even the right, right way to frame it or, or, or state it, Harold, but the use of, of urban land code for the purposes of land use in the long run. You know, I'm going to go pretty general. So I think if you look at it, it is, um, if you look at our, if you go to any neighborhood, and, and you look at it and you see the size of yards, what you're doing in an urban, um, more of an urban development is you're reducing that yard space, you're reducing the setbacks to the road, uh, because again, you're maximizing the value of the land for housing units versus yards. So more units you, per more acre. More units per acre. You and might, we might see uh, the allowance for buildings of more than four, four stories st correct. For, for housing. You, you know, and, and so then what comes with that is um, reduce street widths, um, and, and you know that's when then you're managing multiple codes, the uh, the setbacks that you have from house to house, utility easement setbacks. You know how are you laying in your water lines, your electric lines, and that's the work we're digging yeah. into right now. So that's really what we mean is, you know, think about some of the uh, of our more historical communities. There's places where you can see examples of that in Longmont and places that were built probably in the, you know when the community was first being developed it, it really is the original of square mile looking back to that time going this yeah. is how they built because they were maximizing that and they needed to be within walking distance they didn't of where they cars. were yes. right they didn't have cars they had a horse and you know minimum lot sizes we've been talking right. about that's like minimum lot size maximum lot size like like greg said that's that makes more sense. Yeah. How do we squeeze more closer together so that cities become more walkable, pedestrian friendly, cyclable, and then the amenities that you need will tend to locate near those that denser. That denser and you design with well intention. In where you design with you're intentionally designing where maybe you design those amenities into it. So mm -hmm. I may not have a yard, but I may have a, a larger space in the development that I could utilize. One of the kind of tangential, uh, the Longmont's Main Street Corridor plan uh, is a really great example of rethinking land use just relative to number of parking spaces. I mean, that's in real time right now in the city because of what you're able to do with land more productively than just park cars. It does have an implication then for how many cars you're going to have um, operating right within a, a vicinity. But that's a good example of what's happening right now. We have another. Uh, another audience member and a question. Um, my name is Michael. Oh, I know that. I know that voice. Hey, Michael. Michael Schnauzer. I'm kind of speaking from the dark here, and I'm starting a little worse. Um, first of all, thank you, Dr. Waters, and all the panelists, Harold and, and uh, Eric, and a couple of panelists I haven't had the opportunity to meet. Um, so grateful that you're having this session on this really critical issue. So thank you for that. Thanks for thanks for. Being in the audience. My, my pleasure. As many of you know, I have been an advocate for almost two decades now about lobbying for the city to be proactive about a potential flood event, catastrophic flood event. Unfortunately, we experienced that flood event, and the city's doing a wonderful job to respond to that after the fact. But underneath that is my deeper passion for climate change. I'm incredibly concerned about the existential threat of climate change, not just to humanity, but locally to the city of Longmont. And I am very heartened to see this panel talk about a lot of issues like walkability, social justice, traffic, carbon emissions, things like that. And what we're beginning to do here t tonight is talk about things from a more systemic, holistic point of view from a, what I would phrase a multi-solving point of view, where our solutions don't just solve the issue of housing, but they can also solve the issues of traffic, social justice, climate change, environmental protection, things like that. So my question is, how can we, in the conversation and the narrative, in, within the city of Longmont, 
how can we begin to shift those conversations to a more holistic systems thinking framework so that the solutions are multi solving And I'll just two quick examples. One is regarding wildlife and ecosystem protections. Um, we are a grassland prairie ecosystem. Every single tree here in the wildlife system itself is, every single tree is here because of a consequence of development. Our wildlife ecosystems are enhanced and more robust if you look at the numbers, more species, broader ecosystems because of development. 100 years ago, we had buffalo, we had, you know, we had bears roaming through this area. We're not going to return to that. So it's a very specious argument to say that we need to protect the environment by not allowing development. It's incredibly greenwashing. Um, and relating to the developers making profit, what I'd like to see if there's any comments on how the NIMBYs are actually profiting from their anti-development rhetoric, how the value of their homes is going up by opposing development. And there, there needs to be honest conversations from a systemic point of view. So thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Uh, that's a, there was there was a lot in that <laughs> Michael's statement, and uh, and a couple of questions embedded. Um, and I won't try to restate them. Uh, he didn't and adjust. I just want to yeah. say quickly, talk to your neighbors. I, I have a development going up in my neighborhood of 144 units, and my neighbors are going crazy about it. They are not excited about it. And I am trying to say, but we need housing. We need, and it's not even an affordable housing. It's just workforce housing, home, yeah. you know. And I'm, I'm having conversations with them about our needs and about why it makes sense. Now, maybe it's, we don't want it exactly as the builder is proposing it. Maybe there are different points of access, but we need to be talking to our neighbors about those kind of things. And most of us avoid those difficult conversations. Yeah. We don't want to do that. It's hard. And I would just say we got to because our, our world is at stake. I think, I think Michael's... Michael's point is, is it, we've chosen the hardest thing to solve, in my opinion, is how do you build housing that people can afford to live in to stabilize the community with all of the benefits that, that he was bringing up? And how do we start that conversation? Well, we've started it. That's why we are all sitting here bringing up all of these different issues. So people that are interested in having the conversation and actually solving problems should lean in to what Echo's doing and Anne-Marie, what Prosper's doing, what we're trying to do. We're trying to bring in every element of the community into the conversation because it's not simple and it's not easy. And saying no is the lowest form of intelligence. Solving, solving problems is really, really challenging and in, in this context, extremely complex. So it takes a lot of moving parts, like Harold said, a lot of different things have to happen all incrementally to really start to solve the problem. We have, we have time for one more question, and we have an audience member ready to ask it. Hi, thank you so much for being here. You are all wonderfully involved in such a great critical uh, need in our community is housing and affordable housing. I'm Tara Menza, I'm running for House District 11. Affordable housing is a very important topic, especially in my campaign. If I'm elected to the state legislature, what sorts of things would you need support from me to help you with? Because I want to help with this topic from the state legislature's point of view. There you go, there's, there's a leader leaning in. What's your response? Well, nationwide, uh, legislatures are looking at the issue of zoning and whether um, there should be some guidelines or maybe strings attached to state money to try to encourage good land use planning. Uh, but I wanted to say there's a ballot measure that is going to be on affordable housing this year that has been, raised enough signatures and it is going to be ballot measure 108 and it will have 300 million a year for 17 years for affordable housing. So I think that's really important and talking to people about that and engaging them. Now, I think this ballot measure is imperfect. Are there some things I would have done differently if I 
have drafted it, so I don't want to say it's perfect, but it's statutory, so it can be fixed, and uh, and some of the rulemaking could fix As opposed to constitutional. Right, yeah. right. So I would encourage everybody to look at that. It'll have a different number. It won't be 108 when it gets set on the ballot. Right now it's being called 108. So I would say looking at how to incentivize good land use and how to fund fund housing. We need more money. However, people need to vote for that. <laughs> yeah. And I think the step before that is showing them some of the messages that Prosper's developing of the big picture and how every sector is affected by housing. And it does affect them personally. And it's not just their own little block with their big yard. And it's, it's, going to affect them personally if we don't get a handle on it. So the education piece before the ballot measure, I think, is important. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think what Anne-Marie talked about, uh, you know, so there are some dollars coming out from the state and DOH for um, workforce and affordable housing. And, and you can see some of those strings already in place in terms of they are looking for more dense designs. They're asking questions about turnaround time. Um, how are you dealing with everything we've talked about? And those are requirements in to just the letter of intent for some of these funds. And so I think the big piece is, you know, if you kind of did some rough math on that ballot initiative, I think that equates to about $31,000 per unit. Uh -huh. If you look at the number of units they want to build for that amount, you know, when you start looking at the gap, um, and this is some of the pro formas that we're looking at, depending on land prices and things like that, you know, the gap for um, workforce housing could be around forty to fifty-five, sixty thousand dollars $60,000, depending on the land price. And if we can get assistance to where you can cut that, that lets the cities also come in and do it. But right now, it's all borne by the cities um, in terms of, you know, if you can get a grant, you can do this. But in terms of a long-term sustainable program, it really is how do you start bridging gaps in order to get these units built. And so I think it's incredibly important for the state to really look at this because funding is a huge piece of this. Well, so about half the questions I was going to ask, I haven't had a chance to. So maybe we'll do a second session on this because <laughs> I do think uh, bring, bringing the community along with understanding what the challenges are and what the options are and the rationale. Is, is, is as important as financing and land, and land code and, and, uh, and where the money's going to come from, whether it's the state or the feds or wherever. But we only have a couple of minutes left in this program, so if there are any last thoughts that any of you would like to share, this is your chance to offer. I would say that the thing we're focused on in Prosper Longmont is, Harold mentioned strings, we're trying to get to a point to, to take the market power to start addressing this. Now, there's things that have to shift and move and change to allow that to happen, but it's the only thing big enough to actually really put a dent in it. I've heard many times we can never tax and subsidize our way to housing solutions. It, it's going to take a combination across the spectrum, a bunch of different solutions in order to get there. One of my questions was, take government out of this. How are we going to do this just with, the, with social capital and and what capital is out there in terms of market rate housing. But anyway, other, other final thoughts? No, I, I like Eric's uh, comment because if you get buy-in from business and can influence public policy, I think that in increases the support and then it gets other sectors involved in the solutions. Yeah. Um, I also want to speak a little bit about renters. Um, you know, we talked about a lot about home buying, but um, post fire in some of the communities, we're seeing 40 and 50% rent increases. Yeah. And that is spread yeah. all the way to Longmont. It has. And so I think that right now there's a statewide ban on rent control. So that even if, for example, Louisville and Superior wanted to say after the fire rents can't increase by more than 10% a year for the next yeah. three years, they can't do that. They're, they have no authority under the legislature. Most people don't realize that in the state. That we I know because time. people have said to me, why isn't my local government yeah. doing something to help me after this fire? Mm -hmm. And so we, we, there are things that need to be done. And also in talking to renters, we've had people, we had some really bad circumstances after the fire with landlords behaving badly. 
our law needs to be fixed. Um, there are some ways, and, and there are other things keeping people in their existing home um, who are renters, and also people like seniors who need, you know, maybe just help to yeah. stay in their home. I think we haven't talked about that, and I'd like to say there's lots more to be done there. There is, and that's part of what the city does, I know, with the Affordable Housing Fund. You got about 10 seconds. Well, I, I don't know if I can get it done in 10 <laughs> seconds, but I'll go as fast as I can. We're in the middle of budget right now, and budget is predicated on revenue streams coming in from sales tax, property tax, you name it. And our, our business community is a big part of that in terms of the money we receive. Why, you know, we've talked about all of these issues, but, you know, at the end of the day, if we want to continue to attract companies like Smuckers and, you know, the companies we've had recently, they need places for their staff to live. And I know when we're in those conversations, you know, one of the first questions is, you know, what's your employment picture like? And, and now we're having to, to give them a different example. And, you know, when you look at the long-term financial viability of a community, it's important to have yeah. the labor force there. And I think it gets lost in this conversation, but it is down the road important to a community's overall financial condition to, to have houses where people can live, work in that area. Uh, well, we're over time, but I want to say to you four, there couldn't have been a better panel for this conversation. So thank you so much for, for giving us an hour tonight. More importantly, for what you do every day, day in and day out. I know the kind of service you all, uh, I'm gonna come in, <laughs> the kind of service you all render to the community and, uh, and we're deeply grateful. Um, the next uh, opportunity, maybe the next opportunity for people to learn about <coughs> will be on October 13th. ECHO is hosting, uh, I think there are some others, and, and, and Prosper, uh, hosting a Zoom session um, to learn more about land code and what these, the data that Eric was referring to earlier. So if anybody's interested, um, they could go to uh, echocolorado.com, www.echocolorado.com, and register for the Zoom session. That will be on October 13th. Long Monitors, the next opportunity you'll have to be part of the studio audience, uh, to be part of the backstory, will be on September 26th. And uh, we will be uh, focusing on the Tinker Mill. So thanks to you. Thanks to our studio audience. And thanks for anybody who is listening. That's your backstory on housing in Longmont.